Hey, this is Glendon, and it's going to be really, really different tonight. I'll just tell you what happened. As you know, I don't watch the TV shows, and I put them on my DVR, and I just watch two, three, four, or five at a time. Well, the day I was working on Auction Hunters, and I had another deja vu moment. And essentially, I don't know if I have a case. I don't know, but they have been taking stuff from my blog, which I thought I had hit, but apparently not soon enough, because... What I saw today was directly lifted from my experience in Conyers. I mean, from the safe, from the way I went into it, pulling guns. Pull, I was just like, what the fuck? So, I'm feeling some kind of way. So, the Q&A session, I'm just going to do that, say, Saturday or maybe Sunday. Um, don't know. I'll put it out. But I'm going to you know, not leave you hanging. We're going to move forward with something else that you should know. That you should know about. So this was going to come a little later. And like I said, this week's going to get kind of intense. So this might be a briefer for you. If you have any questions, send them to bootcamp at storageauctionguru.com. There are some in the queue that I need to answer, but I will answer them this week. So with that, let's talk about problem solving. I get a lot of questions about, you know, doing a workshop, doing the boot camp, and people want to see hands on. And I actually have tried to go to auctions, but the thing is, there's so many people at the auctions, you, you can't like talk and dialogue without someone else getting the benefit of that conversation. So it's really a hard thing to do. Then I thought about buying a unit and then telling you why I bought it, but that's not like showing you the heat of the battle. Then I really thought, how can I convey this in a manner that will work for everybody? And I had to take a few steps back and really look at my methodology on how I bought units. And it was like as, ah, it popped out. One of the biggest predicators of me buying a unit was how many problems would it solve? If you remember, you know, I had an extensive background in furniture. So I looked for furniture because I knew furniture. But one thing about furniture, people buy a table and chair set because they need one. They buy a washer and dryer because they need one. They buy a sofa set because they need one. Now, they may spend a little extra for something, a little extra fancy, but I have sold a lot of regular, run-of-the-mill, plain stuff because someone needed that particular item. And that's how I bought my units. Because, let's be real, if a unit is stacked from the root to the to the like, I like them, there's only going to be a few signs. Some of those signs are on point. Sometimes they're just a red herring. But what worked well for me was focusing on things that people needed. And this is the problem solving scheme that I had. We look at the unit. The door would go up and there were several things that were going on. I had regular customers. So I'm going, okay, I have this, I have this. I mean, it's kind of hard to explain how many things, hold on. We're going on. Stack one. Door goes up. I see a room full from the Rula to the Tula, but I see right here is a refrigerator. Okay, that tells me. Usually if there's a refrigerator and it's a 10 by 20, there's going to be a washer and dryer. I'm like, okay, so this is a household unit. What comes up in households? Furniture. Uh, also, some things you don't really think about this so well. Picture frames. Towels. Sheets. My business was predicated on things that people need, things that solve problems. And I think subconsciously, I thought it was something else, but as I've been sitting here putting together you know, information to give to you, it kind of dawned on me. My whole focus for that business, and my partner agreed, was get things that people need. And it's not as hard of a sell. And you don't have to dress it up. The fascination with those damn shows. Yeah, I'm a little salty right now. I'm a little, little salty. Because it, it, it's just like, it's getting to be too much. But, you know, I will get over it one way or another. But the thing is, when you look at a unit, you have to look at, number one, what's in that unit that people need versus what they want? A nice, give you an example, I bought a unit, had a real Rolex, was able to sell it on eBay within a month, had listed it, 
two times two people bought it and flaked and this is something that happens a lot with really nice items people want them but they may not have the money they may and they they can be kind of high hassle i would think 90 percent of the jewelry that we got except for really nice estate stuff that when people would pay decent money i sold for scrap bag unless it was just something really outstanding or something i was going to give to uh, one of my lady friends that I was dating I just scrapped it out because of the lack of hassle because yeah, it's a ring, a gold ring is something that someone wants unless it's a wedding band. You need a wedding band. Those I would sell and those did quite well. But predicate your business on solving problems. And for you, I have an exercise. And it's going to be kind of deep because the thing is you have to figure out what's going to work well for you where you are. Like I have people who are in New York, you know, New Yorkers live in buildings. So a lot of people don't have washer and dryers. They're kind of rare down here. They're all over the place. You may live, say, in Boston. You know, you may get fishing equipment. You may, there, you, and in Boston, you have a chance of getting real period piece antiques because, you know, everything wasn't burnt up up there. So you have to go, number one, you know, and also someone that pointed out, I should let you know that the name of the book may change a little bit. Because right now I'm testing a lot of stuff out, but the book is already well above the original Making Money A to Z. And this section is going to be in the book and it's just going to be more concise and it's going to be layered out. But you definitely have to figure out what's going to work for your town and what's going to work for you based on your abilities. Because the whole core of my successful businesses. I solve problems. And when I was in the furniture business, I was a consultant because sometimes I had to say, that's the problem and this is how we're gonna solve it to make the sale. Going forward, that's what you're gonna to have to do for your customers and clients. The days of you know, features, benefits, it's not completely over, but when you're doing certain things, you have to solve problems. You have to help people along because the internet has completely, well, it hasn't completely leveled the playing field, but it's given the consumer more power than they've ever had before. So people are empowered. More people are doing comparison shopping. So you are a merchant and you know what you went through and you have a great product and you have a great price and it's kind of like big whoop because I can get on the internet and find 20 more people just like you, which creates a serious problem if you're just selling on price. I suggest that, you know, things you have to sell on price, you have to. Certain items are just a commodity. It's just gonna happen. But, and by becoming, say what, a resource for your, your town, that is something that will make you unique. So the whole core of solving problems is number one, identifying the problem. Like, give you an example. <clears throat> I know I'm going all over this place because I'm a little, I'm still pissed off. But what does your town have, and what doesn't it have? Because one of the things that we as entrepreneurs want to do is we come up with this great widget, this nifty thing, and it doesn't fulfill a massive need. It may fill a niche need, which could be good. But in the, in the resale business, to be successful, in my opinion, you need to fill regular run-of-the-mill needs on a consistent basis. The nice stuff, the treasures, the wow factors, the ooh-wee factor, that's nice, but that's not going to keep the lights on and that's not going to pay the bills because they're so far and few between. And when you do get them, a lot of times they're not quick sales. So figure out what does your town need. Two, figure out how can you solve problems in your own business because the number one problem with buying storage auctions units is the logistics and the storage. Buying is easy. <laughs> it's the other stuff that comes after. And I think in many ways you would be better suited to solve those problems quick first before you really get heavy into the game because you, you got to go out there. You, you, you have to do stuff, but you got to solve those problems. And in terms of your business, sit back, 
and ask yourself, what's really the the weak spot of your business? I will tell you, like uh, one thing, one one problem I saw was the flea market. I didn't like the flea market because I was a heavy marketer. I've always marketed everything I did from the furniture, always, Craigslist, whatever. I was just putting the name out there, putting the name out there. So I would do marketing, and I noticed this when I was in the Lothonia flea market, and other people would benefit. And I noticed this with Amazon. I would drive traffic to Amazon. Other people who sold storage auction books benefited. And marketing is very hard work. And I do believe in a certain level of compassion for my fellow man, but wait a minute, you know, it's it's just too hard out here for you to be helping out someone who's not really doing much. You know, in the, in the terms of track and field, they call that drafting. So I was like, the flea market is the best place to move a lot of small, low margin stuff, but there were so many problems there. You had to get there at this insanely early period of time in the morning because when the flea market became vibrant, you had to be there at 4, 30, 5 o'clock to be able to get in to get a space close to the gate. If you were later, you could still you could show up at 12 and get a space, but you're going to be like way on back there on the South 40. So you had to get up early. Then when you got there, you had to set up your booths, pull stuff out, unpack stuff. So you're, you're up at this insane hour. You're, you're pulling stuff out of boxes. You're setting up. You're in the sun. And if you did any marketing, you were actually sharing that with others who did not. And that really, really bothered me. And one day I was like, okay. And my partner and I, we went to lunch. And I was like, we got to do something because we got all this stuff stacking up. But we go to the flea market. We're only going to move 10 to 20% of it. Or if we like really low ball it, we'll move 50, 60% of it. But time, effort, and there was there was an auction that was going on the Saturday. So if I was going to start going to the flea market, that had to go. And I was just like, how did we do this? How did we do this? And then, you know, bam, create your own flea market. Before we moved everything to the warehouse, we used to, you know, and once again, this is on, you know, if you do this, realize you're probably going against all cool enforcement. But on Saturdays, I would fill up the freaking parking lot. I'm not, I'm not talking about one or two parking spots. I'm talking bedroom sets. The store was full. Okay. Get this. The store was full. But the whole parking lot was freaking covered up. I had furniture out there. I had stuff. I had prices and was making deals. And the thing is, some days we would sell a bunch of stuff in the parking lot. And some days we hardly sell a few things, but we would draw people and they would come to the store and they would buy. But either way, we had space to put stuff either in the store and fill up the holes or if the stuff in the, you know, it, it, it worked out. It, it really worked out. And that was how I solved the problem of the flea market and moving low margin items because I detest, I despise working my ass off to help other people who are really not working that hard. And that's what happens when you're a marketer. Like if you just go to the flea market and you do no marketing and you bring none of the customers that you work very hard to gain, that's not so bad. But I remember one day, it was, it was a Saturday, and I was dropping off some stuff. And, you know, just to break it down to you, the Latonia flea market consisted mostly of black vendors and black customers. Few white people, but not that many. Also, there was a certain look to the people that lived in the neighborhood. Well, I'm walking in the flea market and I see this white girl and I see this white guy who kind of look like hipsters. That would be the look they had. And... They're talking to someone else. And just something said, hey, talk to these people. And I said, are you looking for a uh, search? Yeah. And I just looked at the chick. Oh, I was going to tell him where you, you know, you weren't here. I was like, okay. So I went in there. His name was actually Daniel. I actually remember his name. And I showed him because what it was, was a Danish dresser. Mid-century. But it needed a little work. And I was selling it for 100 bucks. You know, if the thing was cleaned up, it had been like $500. But... It, you know, it, it had character. It was still serviceable. It didn't look bad. I took some uh, Howard's, put it on there, had it nice, looking nice. And he and this girl was like, yeah, and they took it. And the dude gave me the money, and they both picked it up, and they started walking to the flea market. 
but you you have to solve these problems. And I'm, this is just me giving you some things that I do. If you ever go to Cracker Barrel, and I know a lot of black folks don't go to Cracker Barrel, but I love Cracker Barrel. Screw them. On the table is this little pyramid game. And every time I go in there, I play it. And my goal is not to just solve it, because I can solve it, but to solve it faster. Because it trains your mind to look at things from a different aspect. That's how you have to look at units. Every unit's not going to be the same, but you have to look at how many problems will that unit solve for your customers. If you look at it as, oh, there's some nice stuff in there, and it should go, and we can get, then you're in the trouble. One of the, one of the things is, like, um, you know, with the shows, you see things that are not 100% accurate because, once again, I was watching the show and Alan and Ton go into this town and they just run over the regulars. That's not going to happen in real life. It's not. Not the way they do it. But in real life, there's a certain thing. Like, if you have a store, you're going to be able to get more money for stuff because... You're going to be able to present it better than someone who doesn't have a store. Well, I shouldn't say a store, a warehouse. Let me just, let's be, insert warehouse in front of store. Warehouse in front of store on everything. You have a warehouse. You have everything set up. You take great pictures, and you can present better than someone who doesn't have that capability. But, trying to think of a unit and give you a clear example of how it solved problems. I'm gonna have to go back, go back. Ah, here's this one. I bought this unit, Tucker. Open up the door, there's nothing but, there's one, two, three mattresses. But, there's two queen mattresses and one double-sided pillow top king mattress. Okay, that's three bedroom sets. They may be three, there's at least three beds in there. Because, you know, you may have the mattresses because everyone doesn't buy the full dresser or the nightstand. But I saw that. Then in the corner, I saw bed rails. That's all I saw. And I was like, okay. In a unit like that, there was only a few of us. I kind of laid back in the cut to see who was interested in it. Because sometimes you can start bidding and raise interest on a unit that someone wasn't interested in because... You didn't go, yeah, I'll give you 50. You go, yeah, $50! <laughs> you know, you do stuff like that. <laughs> you can also do that and fake people into spending more money, but that's a whole other deal. And I saw the unit, and I just waited and waited, and people kind of like walked away because, you know, there was a lot of neck craning and stuff like this. You couldn't really see over it. And then one person was like, hey, can we move the mattresses? And I just love this mattress. She said, no, you can't touch anything. Don't ask me that again. You know the rules. I was like, Yes, and I just sat back, and the person who asked to move the mattresses was looking at me, and I was like, I ain't said a word. I was just waiting, because she was trying to bird dog off me. So I let her. She kept looking, and then the manager was like, "Anyone gonna bid? Anyone gonna bid?" And I was like, yeah, "You know, I give you twenty five. And the chick right there, just to be an ass, she's like a hundred, you know, and cause she didn't know. She was like I said, she was keen, but. The thing is, at that point in time, you could sell a pillow top, double side king size for 250 300 because they were going for 1000 1200 1500 But I knew that, but she didn't. So I had a lot of room just on the mattresses if really there wasn't anything in there. But the whole unit was low from the roots of the tulip. But I didn't buy that unit based on treasure. I bought that unit on, I know I can sell these three mattress sets. You know, provided they were clean. From the side, they looked clean. The fact that they had plastic under the edges gave me hope. And when I did pull them out, they were great. Great condition. No stains, no rips, no smells, and nothing. Easy to sell. And the three-bedroom sets were in there. Another unit. Sports equipment. I'm up in Alpharetta. The door goes up. And there's boxes, totes. Clearly a man's unit. I see a bicycle tire. Well, yeah, I see a bicycle tire. But it's one of those, one, a knockoff, one that you just flip the, the, uh, the you just flip the little switches and you take it on and put it off. I saw that and I was like, okay, Atlanta, we have a lot of avid cyclists here. I'm looking at the unit and any bike, and I already know any bike that has that cap, you know, capability where you can flip the, uh, 
front wheel on and off like that, it's usually not going to be a cheap bike. You know, it may not be thousands and thousands of dollars, but it might be a bike that I can get 150 to 500 for. So I saw that and I said, okay, I've got cyclists. Once again, now, ooh, that should, or ooh, that's nice. Get that thinking out of your mind. Think how many problems can I solve? Oh, looking at the totes, I'm like, oh, okay, I can sell these totes for 10 bucks. And I don't think I've ever did that, but when you're at the unit, you got to start adding up your money really quickly. You know, everyone watches the show, so I'm going to use them as a something not to do. Because you will see them, and they're like, yeah, you know, about 800 That's our limit. This is how I would do certain things. And I might take one of the shows because, oh, yeah, I can't put the shows on YouTube. Because I, you know, copied uh, Storage Wars Season 1 and had it on the channel. I had no ass on it. Well, A&E took offense, and uh, they accused me of copyright infringement, and I had to take it down. So, can't do that on YouTube, but I can do that on my blog. And I may do, or, you know, behind my paywall, I think I can get away with that and that's not going to be a problem. But, the unit, boxes, totes, the bicycle wheel. So, the quick count was, one, two, three, it was like 20. And they're not like cheap totes, not like the $10 totes, but the kind where the lids fold up and down and they interlock. It's like, okay, bam, that's like $20. That's $200. The, the bicycle wheel was very clean. And in this business, you develop an eye for quality. I could check it was dirty yet clean, if that makes any sense. I could tell it was a quality piece, just the way it was made. I'm looking at that, and that's all you could see. That's all you could see. But I knew that I had people who would buy those totes. And in terms of bidding, Sometimes it's cool to be first, sometimes it's cool to be last. To make those decisions, you often need to who you need to know who you're dealing with. Because you never know what's in the crowd. But if you're dealing with people, these techniques are more effective. And I was with a group of people I knew, and it was a man's unit. There was two guys who love man's unit, tools and stuff. They love that stuff. But there was a big unit. Big unit. Ten by twenty. And it wasn't full from the root to the tulip, but it was like stacked up high toward the door and kind of dropped as it went back. And it was a lot for them. And I'm just sitting there and the bidding's going on while I'm looking at everything. And that's something else too. On the TV shows, you see people look, then they stop looking and they start bidding. Well, when people are bidding, that's extra opportunity for you to look in the unit. Because they were bidding and bidding. I didn't know where I was. And I'm working my light, working my light, working my light. And then in the back, I spot a fender, a motorcycle fender. And I turn my light off, but I don't move from the unit because people bird dog you. And I just turned my light off, went to the other side, turned my light somewhere on some bullshit. I didn't need. And I was just like, there's a motorcycle in here. There's a freaking motorcycle in here. So, you know, the bidding's going, the bidding's going, the bidding's going. And you're look. And the thing is, you have to multitask. You know, you look, but you're still paying attention. And the bidding had gotten to $450. And I heard them going once, going twice, $500. And I'm still looking. And that right there, other people came to the unit and they're still looking. He's going, and I get it for $500. Bucks. But I'm looking at what people need. And also, the motorcycle was in there. It was not a Harley Davidson, it was a BMW. And the older one. And that's great when you get vintage stuff because you don't have the registration issues. But base your buying on what people need. I know that's a very, very redundant thing because people don't get that. Okay, now this is how you determine what works for you. At this juncture, you know, you've had the boot camps day one to day two. We're up to day 15. And there's exercises if you've done, you should know where you are. Because part of being successful is working with what you have and working within your abilities. And then once you know what your abilities are, then you can stretch. You have people who are trying to stretch, but they don't even know where the rubber band begins or ends. And then, you know, it just snaps. If you are, you know, solving problems, say you live in an apartment, say you don't have a truck, okay? You got two critical part problems there. 
logistics, and space. That's your big problem to solve. What are you going to do? If you want to get in the game, you're going to have to have some place to store. Uh, the last section was about alternative space and storage. And also said that this whole thing is geared toward people who want to do it full time, get a warehouse, be more involved than the average person. But this is how one of my students, and it took him two years. This was not an immediate thing. It was not an overnight thing. But it took him two years. He was in an apartment. He wanted the business. He was like, I love this. This is me. He had passion for it. He's like, I love this stuff. I love your stories. And I love all these things. And, you know, he paid me uh, at one point. And also, I'll talk about that later. But, you know, he paid me my per hour rate of $150 because he bought all the books, took boot camp. And he said, look, you know, uh, and I actually gave him more time than that. And we just kind of worked out with some stuff. And he called me and what would you do in this situation? And bam, we worked it out. And he, I was like, you know, you have to set some goals. You're going to have to get out that apartment. Because if you have a house, at least you can do your eBay and Amazon stuff there and then store big stuff in the storage unit and also since you're working from home you have a legitimate tax write-off and this guy went from an apartment a little crappy car to getting a four bedroom house and he has a store now but it took him two years and it really didn't get good till this year but this is what we did I set him up I said okay and it's actually in the book but I'm gonna go through it and it's gonna be a modified version of the new book this is what you do. You, you know, solving problems. You get one unit for staging purposes, and it's going to cost you money. One unit for staging purposes where people have enough room to walk around and look at stuff, and one unit that you can stack and you can cram up. And ideally, and I took him, you know, I thought it would take like three months, but it actually took him eight months to get this going because at one point he had four units. He had two showroom units and two warehouse units that you know he just put stuff in he worked out of. and he had his Amazon stuff in there and he had his eBay stuff in there because I said what's gonna happen is you're gonna become claustrophobic in your apartment you, it will take over your apartment you got a one bedroom apartment you don't even want to take this stuff there and he worked it out he got the uh, mobile wireless and he was able to work in the units and you know I get these stories and he just told me he's like this is the best thing that's ever happened to him and is he making like six figures? No, he's not. Probably this year, the way he's going, he's going to probably make a profit of about fifty-five, sixty thousand dollars $60,000. But in his neck of the woods, that's very good income. You know, and he, he said, and these are some of the benefits of really pushing forward. It was a guy who, you know, because you know, people talk to me and I get a lot of emails and stuff I want to share. He didn't get a lot of respect. You know, he was just an average guy that really wasn't doing well in life. And people tend to treat you like shit when you're in that situation. You know, he said his mother and father started to respect him. And, you know, this was not something he was looking for. He wanted to make money. And he's like, his dad came up because his dad and mom, they needed some stuff. And he was like, oh, I got that. And he took it over to the house. And he's like, oh, no, you know, it's, your, it's an early birthday gift, whatever. And he said that has improved his relationship with his parents. His father actually said, you know, you really are doing quite well for yourself. I'm really proud of you. And he said, up until that point in time, his dad never said that to him his whole life. And this was a 32-year-old man. His dad had never, ever said that to him. And he said, even if this business doesn't go on, he said, just what he's learned in these last two years is going to carry him for the rest of his life and other endeavors. So when you look at this business and you look at the problem of it being hard, you look at the problem of you don't see a lot of success very quickly. And for me, when I was a loser, at one point in my life, I was a loser. I used to be really frustrated because I would work hard and there was like no results. And I would work hard and there was no results. And I would get frustrated and I would stop. When I got with Renecrate and then Mason would just die if he heard me say this, they pushed the shit out of me. You know, it's just... The organization was designed where you had to be accountable. There was no way to waffle. You couldn't say, hey, I mean, they will ask you point blank. If you said you made 250 phone calls, they're like, sit down and go mine. And they would like, look at your entries. And I mean, you, you were just, <laughs> they had you like that. 
And it's a very, very uncomfortable experience. It's a very uncomfortable experience. One of the hardest freaking jobs I had in my life because every day I walked through that door, I had to be accountable. And up until my, that point in my life, I wasn't. You know, I did well, you know, being smarter than the average bear because sometimes intelligence can hide laziness. And it just really irked me. But after about six months of hell, it didn't seem like hell anymore because when you do something for a period of time, it becomes a habit. And I still do many of those things that I learned. I only worked for the company for nine months because I got a much better offer because I like doubled my salary like. Bam, I was like, I'm out of here. Like you guys, but hey, this money's talking. And that's the thing I want you to understand. It's supposed to be hard. It's supposed to be challenging. It's supposed to be difficult. Because we live in a society and we live in a digital age where people want the four-hour work week. I've had many people approach me and I even bought the book. This is my opinion of the four-hour work week. It's a good book if you're going to start an internet-based only business. Something that you can run completely from the internet. The storage auction business, the resale business, those are businesses that the internet can help you make a lot of money, but you can't completely run it from the internet because say you sell everything online. No one ever comes to your house. You never have to have a storefront. You just have the place to, to store and ship from. You still got to go out there and get it. <laughs> I mean, I, I know of a few people that buy on Craigslist and buy on eBay and flip around and resell, but the margins aren't as nice when you really do the grunt work. It's just not as nice. But essentially what I'm trying to say is there's going to be a grooming period where it's going to be difficult, challenging, and a pain in the ass. And if you go through that period with some gusto and determination you're going to come out much better off. Now, with solving problems, this is a, I think it's called the Ben Franklin clothes, but I call it my problem solving thing. And, you know, I kill trees. Take a sheet of paper. And also, I know we're used to doing everything on computers, but when you have to write something, your brain activates in a different manner than when you're typing and doing stuff online. It's totally different. It's weird because when I write a book, and I'm looking at it in pages, I see it one way, but when I turn it into like a Mobi file or EPUB file and then move it to my iPad and look at it, it's totally different. It's like, oh shit, I see all these errors now that I couldn't see in front of me. So, humor me, take a sheet of paper, legal paper, you know, go out and get some, they're cheap, draw a graph, you know, draw a line across the top, then a line down the middle. Put over here what your problem is and come up with as many solutions. I don't care how crazy they may be. I don't care if whatever, just come up as many as you can within five to 10, 15 minutes, just solutions, solutions, and do not censor yourself because you're like, oh no, that won't work. No, your goal is, this is the problem. Solution, 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 solution. You'll be amazed that out of all that stuff that doesn't work, there'll be a lot of stuff that does. But you have to kind of like groom your mind to think like that. And it takes time. <clears throat> and that's going to be your exercise. What I want you to do tonight is whatever big problem you have in this resale business, create that graph. And for every problem, this one sheet of paper, this is the problem. Solution, solution, solution. Problem, then flip the page over. Problem, solution. Just do that and just work out some scenarios. Excuse me. I'll give you an example of how I use that method to help me with my online business. The block came back, but for many months I ignored it. I didn't keep it up because I essentially used my blog as a landing page to sell books. And the reason was. I had to make a decision on my personal resources of time. SEO is like that target that does this. Bam! You know, the day, and it's, it just keeps moving. They keep changing it. What works this month doesn't work a few months later. It used to be what worked last year doesn't work this year. And it keeps changing and it keeps changing. And it's maddening. 
Because if you got stuff like, okay, I went ahead and did this, then I realized something. And, you know, with my competition, there wasn't that many people selling storage auction products. It really wasn't. You know, at one point it was just like, bam! Then it kind of narrowed down to just a few. And I looked at where they were, and, you know, many of them were well ahead of me in SEO and black hat search engine techniques, which I'm glad I didn't employ. I never bought any link, I never did any link building, I never bought any followers or any of that stuff because at some point it bites you in the ass. So all my stuff's been built organically. But I could not fight these guys because they knew more than I did. So it's like, okay, so I can sit here and try to get my black belt in SEO real quick while ignoring other stuff because it's time consuming. Or I can use what I have. So I did that, it's like problem. How do I grow my business in this internet madness? And went back and I was like, you know, and I was like, okay, YouTube, SEO, pay a company. Then went back, later on, it's like YouTube, and I went to the dashboard and they, like I said, they give you all this information. And I found out that my YouTube channel had eight times as much traffic as my blog, even on its best, during its best days. During its best days. And I said, huh. So, bam, straight to YouTube. Putting links, leading little blogs, and for a period of time, I actually sold more books and stuff than I ever did before. Then that kind of like slowed down because this market's mature. But that's how I solved that problem because you have to find out what works for you. Because people are looking for cookie cutter, bam, instant solutions, which may work for a short period of time, but mark my words. At some point, you're going to have to find another solution and another solution. So if you orient your business in a sales and solution finding philosophy, you're going to be much better off because you'll be used to coming up with solutions and doing things versus always being a step or two behind. Now, that the focus of the blog has changed and I'm going more with business, personal development stuff, I don't have that issue anymore because... I'm not competing with them because none of those guys even write about that stuff and share more experiences with you. Like, you know, the story up there about how I was part of the team that took care of Curtis Mayfield and all the stuff he taught me. He taught me a lot. Things like that. That's where the blog's going to go. Crazy stuff in storage auctions. Um, leaving the TV shows alone. They're fake. They are. You know, when I say leave them alone, you know, once I talk to the right people, if I have a case, I will sue. If I can't sue and it doesn't make any sense, I'm not. I just have to be honest. But leaving the shows alone and focusing on building on the platform that I've already established, which is, you know, taking the experiences that I had because, you know, give you another example. You know, I've talked about this before. Um, there was a period of time that I was homeless, sleeping in my car, taking showers in the gym. Then I moved to up the hill to a boarding house with crackheads. I have put myself in a very, very bad situation. Very, very bad situation. And the only way for me to get out was to work two full-time jobs. That was the only way. Because all the money I had from my little penny any job went to paying rent, buying groceries, you know, taking care of bills. And I had really nothing left over. I mean, at that point in time... I had to have, I didn't have a car, that was another problem. I had to buy a Marta Pass because I could not afford to get around. Because, you know, you buy the weekly pass and you can use it unlimited. I had to get that every Sunday. I had to get it. And the extra job was, and it took a long time for me to save up money to secure rent and a deposit to get a place and buy furniture and everything. But that was the only solution to that problem. So, you know, many of you may be there. You know, you may be in a situation where things are not going well, but you have to take advantage of your assets. And sometimes you may have to do something radical, such as a friend of mine who's a VP of a company who accumulated a tremendous amount of credit card debt. The way that my friend got from under this hole was to move in with another one of our friends for a year and dedicate $2,000 a month that what she was paying for rent, utilities at her other place. She took all that money because, you know, what the person was charging her rent was minuscule to compare it to what she was paying. And within a year, she eradicated about 68% of that. Like 24 grand. Paid a lot of stuff down. You know, the monthly payment, you know, the minimum payments aren't obscene anymore. 
And that's what it took. But it was a year to get out of it. And when you go through that, you tend not to make the mistake again. When you get the quick fix, well, you know, this happened. There's a quick fix. You know, it's a quick remedy. You know, there's no problem with that. When in reality, in life, this usually is. So, you got your assignment. You know what you need to do. Like I said, um, based on how I set this up, I'm not keeping people. I'm trying to keep it for 45 minutes to an hour. And then that's going to be, you know, so I want you all tied up. Now, let's talk about Nick the rest of the week. You will not be getting an assignment tonight, but you will be getting a bad boy assignment tomorrow. And you're going to be getting more information. And then we're going to go down into the breakdown and some other stuff. And like I said, there are some people who have sent me an email and I haven't gotten to you. But trust me, it's on the list because, like I said, I'm, I'm, I'm going through it. I'm going through it. Because I don't allow my sister to go through my emails because there's all kind of crazy stuff in there. And when I tried that, they couldn't answer any of the emails. So what's the point? I got to do it anyway. So I will be going through that, getting back to folks. And also, let you know, the boot camp is going to change radically for the next one. Because I've got a few things kind of halfway figured out. I will share them with you. I found a site that... I can have videos up and I don't have to put them on my website and you can get a subscription. All of you that are here, you know, you'll get a discount subscription because the next boot camp, which I'm going to call it the workshop, will be August 14th and it's going to be even a little bit better. But, you know, I can hook that up. You know, for other folks, they're going to have to pay a grip if they want to get in. And also, I am going to probably do the... I buy iprofit.com video because there's a lot of things that I want to share with you that I don't really talk about because once again solving problems I'll give you a great example when I put up a video that talks about something like a business plan CRM customer relationship management I don't really get any views but if I put up some salacious with a half naked woman BAM <laughs> and I'm just like okay so I'm going to separate those two crowds. And also, like I said, uh, I'm almost at the end of my 100 videos and 100 day challenge because I'm at 79 on the regular ones. And then there's 11 crazy Craigslist stories. So 11 more videos and I'm done. And I'm going to take a break and work on this other stuff. So because I'm not going to lie, crap was hard. <laughs> it was hard and I just have a few I have just enough juice to finish this up but a lot of good stuff is going to come and going forward you know also you know if you're, you're part of this group you're already on one mailing list everything goes through the mailing list I put up a video I put up a blog post I send you an email so you don't have to worry about subscribing to YouTube you don't have to worry about subscribe I haven't been doing it with every post on the 100 day challenge because some days there were five or six posts and I was like okay let's just let that start a little later but now I'm just going to do one video a day that's not too onerous and they're going to be a mixture of short and long so everything goes through the mailing list so you won't miss out on anything and also just to give you another heads up about two to three weeks after this is when you're going to get the book because what I've been sending to you is what I can do, but I have, you know, proofreaders. So once it's done and all set up, it goes to them, then all the mistakes are fixed. Then we print it up. And you, if you notice that things have gotten a lot better. So I've been writing like freaking every day. And it's like, if you write every day, it gets easier and it's better. I mean, I used to do 500 words. Now I'm up to about 2,000, 3,000 words a day. And I'm also writing various projects. Uh, oh, yeah. Forgot to say. Uh, the Hustler Mindset will be done this year. I've been taking kind of like a different route with that. But that's coming out. And there's some other little juicy stuff that's coming out. But it's not quite ready. But you will get to know about it. Because the whole focus of my YouTube channel, the blog, is going to go toward business development, sales techniques, marketing. That's going to be the whole enchilada. Because... 
based on what I saw today, yeah, I'm going back to it because I'm getting mad again. I need to protect myself in terms of the content I put out because I thought the stories were okay. Many of you thought they were great, and I thank you for that. And apparently the television shows thought they were the shit because it's not a coincidence, and it's irking the stuff. It's just it's irking the shit out of me. So by putting the new stories, because there's many things I've never talked about. I'm going to put it in book form. Then I may do a video about it. And then we'll see what happens. Because I might be too late. I don't know. It may be too expensive to pursue. But mark my words, I'm about to stem. I'm about to stop that crap. You know, it's not reality. Fine. Use someone else's stuff. Leave my shit alone. Okay, enough of that. Enough of that. Enough of that. I'm going to come back off of that. All right, so once again, if you have any questions, send them to bootcamp at storageauctionguru.com. And I, like I said earlier in the video, let me write it down. Didn't mean to do that. I will have another Q&A. Let's see, what is the day? Because one of the, another reason I'm doing this with videos is football season's coming up, okay? I am not going to be doing any webinars on a Monday night. It's not going to happen. And Saturday, you can forget it. Like 32 more days, baby. Okay. All right. Let's open up the calendar here. Let's see. Today is about the 30th. Yeah. Um, q and I will do Saturday at let's see 3 p.m. Q&A webinar that's Saturday which is the 4th of August at 3 p.m. and since I'm doing this I can't send the link but I will set that up as soon as I shut this off and then we can do the questions and answers because at that point I will be in a much better frame of mind to answer questions because right now I might, you know, go off on somebody and I don't really need to do that. Okay, well that's it. And like I said, not leaving you hanging. Hopefully you got some great information from this and uh, I will see you tomorrow in your email box.